Um, thank you. And uh, Tim was persuading me the last couple of weeks to come along. He said, wouldn't you love to have a break from the family? And I was like, well, Tim, that's, you know, not the right attitude to have. Um, so I, I am here. Yes, I'm getting a break from the family. Um, hi, family. Uh, so, yeah, it's great to be here. I'm delighted to be with you. You have... Um, You've really had a, a fantastic overview of so many issues relating to land use and land use change over the last couple of days. I've been dipping in as I've been traveling, and I really hope uh, this morning that I can convey I suppose, some of the values um, and some of the really intricate details of peatlands. I've only got 15 minutes. Um, from my own perspective, I am a restoration ecologist. Uh, I started working on restoration 25 years ago in Northwest Mayo, when restoration really wasn't a word that was quite common uh, for people, and we hear a lot about it now. Since then, I've worked on peatland restoration, wetland restoration, woodland restoration, and now I'm currently working on coastal restoration. Um, but uh, yeah, peatlands are awesome, and indeed nature is awesome. And I suppose one of the things that I found is that within peatlands, when we talk about you know, the web of life, it's, it's none, almost nowhere so obvious as within the peatlands. Those intricate webs within webs, the biodiversity web within the hydrological web, and within the soil then as well. So this morning, I'm going to give you a whistle-stop tour of what are peatlands why they develop, what's peat, where, where do we find them, the global context and indeed the local context. I'll talk about why the peatlands matter, what the, their contributions to human society, things like ecosystem services, and focusing in then on the biodiversity component. I'll talk then about how we use peatlands and what state the peatlands are in, which is really important. What, what's, what's our starting point from today? And then I'll just reflect a little bit on, you know, how policy has changed over time. And, you know, that word has been used an awful lot over the last couple of days, policy. And clarity is a word that I find um, keeps coming up, that we don't have that clarity in relation to policy and how that drives how we use these systems. So first up, Pete. So um, I think some of you might have got a nice video of me walking through a peatland. Um, I think uh, Avian sent it around. But you know, peat is wet. Uh, peat, peatlands are wetlands. And I suppose the unifying and the common denominator of all peatlands is this thing called peat. So peat is partially decomposed plant material that has accumulated over time. And it's predominantly comprised of this wonderful plant it's a moss. Imagine a moss dominating an entire ecosystem. But in this situation, it's sphagnum moss. So it's, it's really um, high, high carbon content. It's you know, vast layers of it develop over time to form a peat land. It's, it's the qualities of this peat that have, have largely driven its use as a growing medium and also as a fuel. So it's often weed-free because it's been buried for thousands of years. And then of that high carbon content means that it's really good for burning. So that that is that has sort of lent its its use from the perspective of the growing medium and the fuel. But I suppose when you put the peat in the peat land, it's really it's really sort of more the, the living component that, that brings the water and the biodiversity together, and we'll see that uh, through the course of this presentation. So where do we have peatlands in Ireland? So we have peatlands pretty much in every county. Uh, Wexford kind of escapes, although I think there's a small fen down there, you know, the sunny southeast that kind of got away from the peat. A colleague of mine uh, has developed a map of the peatlands of Ireland, and you can see the extent there, the red being the raised bogs, and then the blue and green being the, the, the blanket bogs. The yellow represents the area that were developed for industrial peatlands. And let's put that into the global context. So Ireland is a hotspot. So up to 20% of our land is covered in peatland or peat soils. 
So you can see this map showing, you know, the darker colours here in this global map show the hotspots. So Ireland is really up there. You know, we have a huge responsibility in terms of, you know, the global resource of peatlands. You can see other countries like Finland and Canada and Russia, and equally, equally then in the, in the tropical region, regions around Indonesia. So what do they look like? They look very like our own in some cases and quite different in others. So in North America, the local name there is muskeg. Uh, so that's what they call their peatlands, and it really comprises these sort of more sparsely um, uh, are, areas of, of sparse conifers with then these really intricate uh, pool systems. Finland, not dissimilar, but then when we get to the tropical regions, we see they're really different. They're tropical peatlands, they're tropical rainforests with huge volumes of peat. And many of these areas would have been drained for uh, palm oil plantations, so that's why we, we hear about them in the news. And the, the drainage of the tropical peatlands really has led to huge um, risk in terms of fire and loss of livelihood, but also loss of life and uh, huge contributions to carbon dioxide levels in, in the atmosphere. So tropical peatlands, uh, you will have heard about those recently. Just recently, they discovered a peatland the size of the island of Britain in the Congo. So, and, and we're also further furthering our understanding of where the peatlands are in South America. In all of these cases, the peatland, they're all different, they're all unique examples, but in each case, it's all to do with waterlogged soil, that's peat, and it's the biodiversity. So these, if you tweak one of these components, then you change the peatland. So let's get back to Ireland. Uh, Ireland has uh, an array of different types of peatlands. We break them largely into fens and to bogs. Fens, I really have to shout them out. I think something happened there. Um, because they're often neglected uh, and undervalued. Uh, really really diverse. Something has happened. I've gone into Zoom on this. Um, Carla, we might need you as our tech lead. I'll just leave. I think it was because I started talking about fans, it got confused. Okay. So fans, um, we would have had more of these in time, but they've largely been drained for agriculture. There, we've got some really good examples remaining around Pollardstown in County Kildare, and then, you know, small fragments of fen scattered throughout the agricultural landscape. And we talked about, you know, drainage of wetlands, but in, in a lot of cases, it can be these small pockets of fens that we lose due to, to drainage and, and so-called land improvement. Our bogs are quite extensive, and here we have vast areas of blanket peatlands in the west of Ireland. And I suppose these have been a source of much inspiration for artists and poets over time. And it's, it, indeed, this is where I spent uh, most of my early research days. And you can see the, the sphagnum moss here and, you know, the miniature sundews that are out on the peatlands. And, you know, really, I would highly recommend for you to get out onto your own local peatland for a walk, just so that you can really understand and appreciate um, the, the minutia and the wonders of the, of the small things on these peatlands. So what do our peatlands do for us? So I've summarized here some of the, the services that they provide for us and, and really often overlooked are, is their role in water quality. We talk a lot about the, the climate value. We, we recognize now that they're vast stores of, of carbon and equally that they're there are places that can actually absorb carbon as well, so they can be a sink uh, for carbon. Um, and today we're focusing in on the biodiversity, and if I, if I had time, I'd be quoting Seamus Heaney here, uh, because really it's that sense of place, it's that day on the bog, it's really embedded in our social and our cultural psyche. Uh, the bog woman and the bog man, Seamus is gonna step up, and Kieran as well will call themselves uh, bog people. Um, but the biodiversity, so we continue to lose our peatlands, and I'll talk about how we've used them um, next, but really the biodiversity component is quite splendid and captured quite well by 
uh, one of our great artists, Tina Claffey, who's a fantastic photographer. But the biodiversity, again, intricately entwined with the water and the peat. So every time we tweak one of these, uh, we affect our peatlands. So how have we used our peatlands? Well, this is a picture of an industrial peat extraction landscape. Uh, you know, I worked in Borden Mona for several years, working on rehabilitation and restoration of the peatlands there. Um, this is quite a different situation. It's dry, it's not wet, there's no biodiversity here. Um, and, and we're taking the peat uh, for, for use as a fuel, but also as a growing media. So back to policy here, the, meat, the policy driving here is food, energy. We've drained large areas for agriculture. We've drained large areas to plant trees for timber. And we have planted our peatlands with turbines from an energy perspective. And those remaining examples that we have that we haven't used to or modified greatly, we have thankfully conserved and we, we are trying to restore some of those under the Natura 2000 network. Um, the sad story is that only small fragments of our peatlands remain intact. And most of our peatlands are actually in a degraded form. So, you know, it's, it's not a good story that I'm presenting this morning. Uh, we continue to lose our biodiversity from our peatlands. We, we're losing our species like curlew. Um, we're down to about 100 breeding pairs uh, on our wetlands, and they're largely uh, only on our peatlands now. So degraded peatlands, not only does that mean loss of biodiversity, but equally when we have degraded peatlands, it affects our water quality and it also affects our carbon balance. So there's an immediate win here if we decide to work on our peatlands. Um, and so just a, a, a quick reflection on the peatlands and how policy have changed over time and an example of an un regulated use of peatland, uh, very unregulated, and that's the peat extraction uh, industry and uh, domestic peat extraction as well, largely unregulated. And over time, we've, you know, originally our, our drive was we need to heat our homes, you know, we're a poor nation. And then we realized there was money in peat and, you know, as a growing media and, you know, we still, there's lots of people who still only use peat as a source of fuel for their homes. And that's, you know, that's a really important consideration when we start saying we need to stop cutting peat, but we need to offer these people an alternative. And, you know, to get from this situation to back to restoration, we have to ensure that there is a true just transition, not just sort of uh, waffle about, oh, well, just transition and we'll throw a load, a load of money at that. and. Money isn't always the answer, it's how we use it, and it's how we engage with people, uh, that we can get the money to the ground to get the true value of the, of the work. So over time, we've gone from dig to dam. So, you know, in terms of Board and Mona, you can see how they've reversed their tagline, uh, I suppose. They're now a climate solutions company. They've gone from digging peat out to now restoring. So yeah, that's, that's a good thing. Uh, that's a good thing. And we need to ensure that we continue that changing perspective. Um, so there are good news stories. There are positive moves in terms of restoration. And a big shout out to my colleagues in Wild Atlantic Nature Life, which are really sort of leading the charge on the restoration on the blanket bogs. Uh, the Community Wetlands Forum is just an absolute uh, treasure and wonder to be part of in terms of the, the community spirit. Um, you know, we talked about the day and the bog and, you know, this romantic notion of, of the cutting of the turf and Seamus might talk about that. But now it's reversed to, you know, the day on the bog where we're actually restoring the bog and we're actually monitoring the butterflies and all of the great um, biodiversity that's out there. So there's great initiatives and for sure the state has to play a part. Uh, for sure Bordemona has started and I know that uh, Quilche, who has over 200,000 hectares of peatland in their uh, resources, uh, have a lot more to do. So. 
I haven't seen the red light yet, uh, Tim, so you're, you're falling behind yourself there. Um, uh, it's uh, bang on time. Uh, I really, to me, it's time to, to rethink our policy. You know, I'm, you know, I'd written this slide before I came up here today, and I see that repeated in our conversations. We need to renew ambition and innovation. It's not just good enough to say, well, well, we'll stick a load of turbines out there. Let's think about other smarter solutions for energy so we don't have to lose a unique ecosystem to generate electricity. So this is sort of a perverse component there. We need to restore the future, the future of peatlands for water, for biodiversity, and for climate. And that's when we'll reap the, the co-benefits. Uh, I've worked uh, and I've just, I've been honoured to work in restoration through my entire career and that is what gives me hope and I want to extend that hope to each of you today that if we develop a peatland action plan that focuses in on restoration, targeted restoration, doesn't, you know, uses the money wisely, it doesn't need a whole lot of money, it needs will, it needs wisdom, it needs clear thinking, it needs flexibility, but it's definitely time to restore. Um, so, in summary, thank you, Tim, I'm on the red light now, I'm on the red one. Um, healthy peatlands are wetlands, they're wet, you know, they're not, if you, you need to have your wellies on. If you don't have your wellies on, you're not in a proper peatland. When we tweak one of the co components of water, biodiversity, or the peat, we change the system. So that's when we, it's time for us to, to reverse that. Ireland's a hotspot for peatlands, so we have a responsibility to look after them. It's time to restore, and restoration takes time. But inaction is not an option, and it requires working across sectors. That means clarity of roles and responsibilities clarity of legislation and policy, followed by regulation and enforcement. There's no point in having a policy and in having legislation when you do not enforce it. And I've seen that uh, to the detriment of many peatlands. So we have legislation, let's use it, and let's look for solutions and opportunities. And we need leaders and we need champions, and you're going to hear from three champions and leaders of uh, peatland restoration um, this morning. Um, so thank you, Gurmila Mahagav.